And that brings us to our superintendent's report, Dr. Hefner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, indeed, um, great things continue to happen here in um, Lexington Richland 5. We were uh, very pleased to, to see uh, two of our schools on the latest list uh, from U.S. News and World Report of the best high schools uh, in our state and in America. I think by being at the top of our state, it places them, uh, is it, uh, Mr. Bounds, is in the top 1% nationally. And uh, in South Carolina, uh, Dutch Fork High School finished number three, uh, only surpassed by uh, two magnet schools that have selective admission criteria in Charleston. So we had the number one high school uh, for schools that accept uh, all students. And Chapin was number eight. And uh, so we're, we uh, congratulate them on their uh, uh, being recognized for being the fine schools that they are. Uh, also in Skills USA competition, which I hope that you will hear more about in um, uh, the next few weeks, but our, um, our district had the number, uh, we had the most first place, most second place, and most overall winners of any district in South Carolina. So congratulations to all of our schools and the center for such a fine showing in Skills uh, USA. Now tonight, before we go to our report from the Office of Finance and Operations, uh, Dr. Milton uh, is going to just give you a quick update on where we are uh, with technology. And so at this time, I will uh, uh, turn it over to Dr. Milton, our Chief Instructional Officer. Thank you, Dr. Hefner. Chairman Gant, board members tonight, I'm going to give you a brief overview. Much of this information is reviewed for you, but hopefully this will be in context to put thing in a, things in a linear order so that you can see the accomplishments we've made thus far for technology in School District 5. And before I begin, I have to make sure I stop to pause to say this is a collaborative effort, not just the instructional division, but it's included all the divisions that you see here represented here tonight. Our first slide is going to remind you of our I-5 vision, but I want to call your attention to the bottom bullet that's in bold print. We really are focusing on creating communicators, creative students, critical thinkers, and also collaborators of information. The other things that you see, we feel the three previous bullets all build up to those four C's that you see highlighted there for you. Now, obviously, with our vision, it follows by what we expect our students to be able to do. These statements that you see here are taken directly from Dr. Hefner's vision 2015 that he's worked on for the last several years to make sure that we could achieve these tasks with our students to have them prepared for workforce and college readiness. This quote, although it's kind of dated from 2009, we have held this as a guiding light for us. Simply adding technology to K through 12 environments does not improve learning. What matters is how it is used to develop knowledge and skills. We've been very intentional to make sure that we're preparing our students for various adaptable devices rather than focusing on one sort of device. We wanna make sure that our students can use whatever device they've been given in an environment to improve their learning, to make sure they're developing the skills and the knowledge that they need to be successful at the next level. This is the document that people are seeing across the state because our General Assembly is getting behind this so that as a, as a state, we can have this as a guiding light for our work, addressing the world-class knowledge, world-class skills, and also the life and career characteristics. And although that's not the sole purpose that we're doing here tonight, it has came along at the right time for us in School District 5 because the themes that you see here are directly interrelated with what we're doing in technology integration in School District 5. So the next slide, we're going to show you how this work actually aligns with what we're doing in School District 5. We've taken five, five statements from the profile, the South Carolina graduate, and we've aligned it with what's known as ISTE, which is an International Society for Technology and Education Standards. So you see six standards on the ISTE side, five on the profile side. But look at how closely these things align. So our students are getting preparation to make sure that we're not just addressing South Carolina expectations, but also expectations that have been defined for the international level that guide the work of many school districts around the world. The next several slides, we've broken down for you a timeline. Obviously, we've been working diligently on this implementation over the last several years. So I'm going to remind you, way back in 2011 and 2012, our work began with Dr. Hefner's vision in 2015. There was a task force that was created some of you actually worked on this. Ms. Hutchison was one of the members that was key instrumentally with working on this. 
The, division, the vision that we designed based on 2015, we wanted to make sure that it was going to ground our work to prepare us for the future. And if you look across the bottom, the ongoing professional development and infrastructure improvements, that has been the, the foundation of all the work that we've done. We have to make sure we provide professional development for our teachers. And we have to make sure that we have the infrastructure to support the, the tasks that we're trying to pursue. So that was 11 and 12. Then following that in 12 and 13, you see more work was done. So the high school technology task force came together. And that task force decided at that time that we would choose a device of iPad minis for our high school students. The iPads themselves were issued to our high school teachers. We thought it was important that while students were getting devices, that our teachers were being prepared how to use them as well. And then you also see the additional technology staff, both in my department and also Mr. Richardson's the technology department. We had to make sure that we had the technicians on staff in Mr. Richardson's department, and then also the instructional staff in my department, that we could meet the needs of our teachers and also of our students. So moving on now to 2013-2014, the work continued. Our high school students had their iPad minis issued to them, so the previous year the teachers got the devices to be, to be prepared. The following year the high school students got them themselves. The iPads were also issued to our middle school teachers to make sure they were prepared for what was to come the following year. At that time, Mr. Bounds took on the leadership of the Middle School Technology Task Force. He made sure that we used a rubric that defined the work, the decisions that we needed to make, ranging from cost to devices to how long they could operate with that need to be charged, the durability, all those different factors that would influence what we were trying to accomplish. And of course, what the instructional vision was going to be as well was in that rubric. And then you see it here again, more instructional staff need to be necessary to reach the needs of our middle schools. At that time, we did not have the staff that we felt was necessary to work with teachers in small group planning to, in, to deliver the professional development. Next, you see 2014, 2015. This is a year that we issued our Chromebooks to all of our middle school students. And I have to pause to say when I say all students, do understand there are some students that are middle school, such as may not have a, an appropriate device of a Chromebook. So if you look at some of our special needs students, you may see iPads in their hands in lieu of a Chromebook because the device is more appropriate. So when you see the, the iPad mini at the high school level and the Chromebook at the middle school level, it's more about the appropriate device, but on average, these are devices that we distributed in 14, 15 to our middle school students. At that time, we started a high school measuring success committee that's been led by our instructional technology coordinator, Jenny Garris, who's in the back of the room tonight. I see her waving. She and the committee have worked together. How are we going to gauge and measure the success of which we're trying to accomplish? And how do we know we're making a difference? It's really difficult to tease out what kind of a difference technology may be making on achievement. But there are ways that we can look to see what perceptions are, what implementation are, what the use is to make sure that this is truly making an impact on instruction and achievement. And then you also see an elementary task force was convened last year. This too was led by Mr. Bounds to make sure that we were hearing from the community inclusive of administrators, teachers, and parent leaders so that we can make well-informed decisions on their input, but also the vision that we have. And then you see across the bottom this ongoing professional development and infrastructure. That's not a one-year commitment. That has been ongoing throughout this process. So where are we now? 2015, 2016. Um, Ms. Garris and her committee, we have now expanded to the middle school level. What we're measuring at the high school level, it is appropriate to measure at the middle school level. There are two different devices, different developmental expectations. So we decided let's bring together a committee, and she and that committee have worked throughout the school year. This year, we're entering a brand new arena. We're beginning optional online state assessments for our state for thir grades three through eight. And then you see the digital citizenship. We're very concerned and want to be proactive to make sure that our students are prepared to be responsible when they are online, as young as our kindergarten students all the way up through our more seasoned students at the high school level. So what are we doing to make sure that we are preparing them to be, to be citizens in a digital environment? So what's to come? We need to make sure that we're prepared to implement the mandated online state testing requirements that are going to be instituted next year. We need to also make sure that we're updating our technology three-year plan. If you remember, Mr. Bounds brought to you back in January a five-year strategic plan, but this is a different plan that Mr. Richardson and his, his department will be taking on for a three-year plan. We're going to need to continue to align our resources to achieve our I-5 vision, and by resources, we mean human resources, financial resources, all the things at our discretion to accomplish the vision that you saw early on in this presentation. And then we need to make sure that we continue to align and monitor the resources that we have for the I-5 vision to make sure that we're aligning all the work and making the best decision, and most importantly, staying current and abreast. If you think back to 2009, 2010, 
things that happened then with technology are now out of date. So we can't just make a decision one time four or five or eight years ago and stay with that decision. We have to keep reviewing where are we now and what needs to come next. So we believe the I-5, which is the initiative that we've entitled this to be, is more than just a, a device. It's about learning. It's about student achievement. It's about engagement, collaboration, problem solving, and creativity. Here on this slide, we've given to you some resources that you may want to investigate a little bit more. If you would like to learn more about the I-5 Technology Initiative, we have a link for you there. The Profile of the South Carolina Graduate, we have a link for you there. Our Technology Training Center, known as TTC, one of our many acronyms, we have a link for you here to see all the professional development that we're offering both within our schools and within our technology training center so that you can see how we're specializing and differentiating the courses and the coursework that we offer to our teachers. And then you see ISTE, which are those standards that I mentioned earlier when comparing with the profile, in case you'd like to learn a little bit more about that. I'd like to also introduce to you Linda von Billen, who's in the back of the room. She and Jenny have worked together on this presentation, Teresa Richardson, who couldn't be here tonight. And when we as a department were trying to define what we believe about I-5 and what we want technology to look like within the classroom, we thought this is a visual that would really put together what we are trying to strive to accomplish. Innovative teaching, integrative learning, obviously this is all through instruction, influencing collaboration and invigorating communication. Dr. Hefner, that concludes the report unless you'd like to accept any questions. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Milton, uh, yes. Hutchinson. Thank you. That was a great report. I appreciate the, the history and the timeline. Can you tell us what, um, you said you're measuring success, which is wonderful. Can you tell us how you are doing that? Yes, ma'am. Last year, the first year for the high school group, we wanted to survey our high school students. So Ms. Garris and the committee that we, we pulled together, and this is a voluntary committee of people that range in their comfort and proficiency with technology from the classroom all the way through administration. So the use varies. The observations, of course, vary. So with the measuring success, we're looking to survey our students. And last year, we surveyed our high school students. And we had that data in here, but for the sake of time, we pulled it out. I said, we can always bring that back to them later. But we had some specific things that we were looking for, such as back to the, the slide where I showed you we were looking at for expectations of students. Um, are your, I'm sorry, Mark, I just messed this up. Um, are, you, are your teachers asking you to download information? Are your teachers asking you to research your information? So all those things, um, I'm going back to the previous one, Mark, sorry. I'll, I'll take it away from you. I got, I, <laughs> I'll drive down. Thank you. So these, these statements that you see here of downloading, researching, uploading, those things, we designed a survey asking specifically, are your teachers asking to do that? And that gave us great insight from maybe it varied for classes. Maybe it's not as appropriate for a math class to do some of the things that we're asking for, downloading instructional material, because you may be using paper and pencil or other devices to do that. But it really gave us good insight. But we felt like last year was more of a baseline information. Our middle school, we've not gotten to that point yet. Ms. Garrison and the committee have worked on when we're going to roll that out. When you survey, we have to make sure we're careful what time of the year. It's not the best time to survey during exam periods. It's not the best time we're trying to review for exams, but if you do it too soon, then you really haven't gotten a good picture of the school year. So we're trying to target towards the end of the school year when most of our assessments are behind us, and we can really bring closure to the year, giving our teachers an opportunity to really look to see that they've accomplished and have the opportunity to accomplish what we want to accomplish in the instructional program. So the perception is a big thing for the survey that we tried to accomplish. And then, of course, we're looking at classroom mosaic observations, are our administrators seeing the teachers leading this instructionally? And what kind of carryover are we seeing from that? Professional development, where are our teachers signing up for? We've assessed our teachers or several as teachers asking, I can statements for them. I can teach my class how to download materials. Maybe you're not quite as confident that you can do that, so then you would respond differently to a survey question like that. So Ms. Garris and our digital integration specialists would then design sessions needed for those teachers in those schools, and it would be volunteer as to what you sign up that's the best fit for you during that allocated professional development time. For the, um, the feedback from teachers, it sounds like it's, mm -hmm. it's somewhat um, scripted. Do, are there opportunities for the teachers to provide feedback um, where they could talk about some of the, the problems that they see or you know, whatever it is, the gr how great it is, so that they have a free form to mm -hmm. express their, their views of success. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Actually, there's a couple. Ms. Garris meets on a monthly basis with our digital integration specialist, and she wants to make sure that she hears the needs from middle school because they're there on a daily basis, high school they're on a daily basis, 
whereas our elementary digital integration specialist, they travel among three schools. So she listens to them separately because a high school digital integration specialist is going to have a lot of teachers but in one campus, whereas an elementary digital integration specialist is going to have a lot of teachers on various campuses. So we try to make sure that we're listening differently to pick up on where the patterns are. So we're listening to things that our digital integration specialists are sharing on behalf of teachers with Ms. Garris. We're also listening through faculty advisory. Dr. Hefner will tell you that we consistently hear from teachers who bring things to us in that arena that are speaking on behalf of those that they represent so that we can be in tune with them. Through the committees, of the, uh, the measuring success committees that we talked about, we make sure that we communicate with the school faculties who the representative is, and we give them assignments to go back and ask questions of people. For example, one thing that we discovered is this particular slide here. Maybe it wasn't as visible as it could or should have been to remind teachers that we're striving towards this. So maybe a teacher's been using devices based on their own experience at their own comfort level, but maybe they forgot about the online academic discussions. But then meanwhile, do we actually have the infrastructure and have we secured that? So as we look ahead to next year, one of the things that Dr. Jakes and I have requested of our budget request is to create a platform of an online classroom so that our teachers can be more involved with collaborative online discussions through professional development. Ms. Garris and her team have worked on using the Google Classroom because that allows some online discussions where teachers are collaborate, collaborating and not even being on the same campus or the same hallway, but they're able to have those discussions across the system to be better in tune with what's going on. So a lot of different talking and making sure that we're assessing things and then the survey piece as well of make sure that we hear from teachers what they see as their need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Baumgartner. <clears throat> um, you mentioned online testing for the kids. Uh, one of the concerns that I, a kid, uh, elementary school student shared with me is they were concerned that their typing, keyboarding skills yes, were not adequate for a time test yes, on, on a computer. Are we looked at starting keyboarding earlier or to address that need? Yes, ma'am. Actually, and let me get, uh, insert the disclaimer because you all know this, but Ashlyn, maybe I need to look at you. Online testing is mandated by the state of South Carolina, not by School District 5. <laughs> so if you can make sure that's loud and clear on the oh. video. Uh, we don't want anyone to think that is a District 5 effort. Mm -hmm. We are mandated by state law to do that. That is not our request. That's us being in compliance with what the state of South Carolina expects through legislation. So we are looking at keyboarding for the coming year. Our principals have been heavily involved with reviewing our keyboarding expectations. Ms. Garrison, her team, and our elementary principals have looked at what we expect for middle schoolers to do, and then we tried to back it up. But this is going to be the first year we've actually tried to do that. So we have to make sure there's ample lab time, there's an ample resource available to make sure that we're offering students what they need to be offered to be ready to type in third grade. And in a scenario that is high pressure, we, we realize that. So um, I would candidly say it makes me nervous, but we will do well. As Dr. Hefner always says, our students always perform well because our teachers have them prepared. And we'll have as many experiences as we can. You'll notice in the timeline we talked about devices at high school and also middle school, mm -hmm. but you didn't hear us say that there's devices of the one-to-one -one at the elementary level. Well, that's because the task force last year made the recommendation, so we have that we may want to review it depending on when it comes up, but we did not have the funding for this current fiscal year that we could go towards that. We do have a couple of schools through MSAP funding, their federal funds, or through some PTO efforts that have gotten devices, but we don't have a one-to-one -one in, in effect at this time at the elementary level. There are devices, but they're not all consistently the same devices. So we've got to make sure that we're prepared for that for the coming year, since now online testing is mandated for us by the state. Ms. Hammond. Um, and I'll reiterate what you were saying about the collaborative campus. Um, the, the, this year, like our, our middle school was very scared about that. Mm -hmm. But we did have some choice with the state. You know, they've given right. us some time as far as the schools. But my questions are student centered. Um, do we in District 5 have a policy like, say, with the devices, are they assigned to individual students and then they keep them through their lifetime of the school and take them home and, and you know, bring them back and forth. And it's like material and it has to come uh, already, you know, ready to run. I don't they powered it while they went home so it was ready to work in your classroom so the teachers can have a consistent classroom where they don't have three or four that didn't bring. Um, or do we keep a classroom set? and then they're in there ready to roll with, for the teacher. I, I, I know that that can be a real problem in teaching and learning, so I wanted to see what our policy was. We actually have both. We have classroom sets, and for the schools that may have, have um, a lower acceptance rate, 
We have some families that choose not to accept devices for their own reasons. Maybe they want their child to use a device they've purchased. Maybe they don't want their child to have a device at all. We respect that families have that opportunity. But we want to make sure that when an assignment requires typing or requires researching that we do offer that tool. So we do have classroom sets that our teachers can check out at our schools. Um, for those that actually turn in, I'm going to look to Ms. Richardson. In the past, I can tell you, we have collected the devices because, remember, between 8th grade and ninth grade, our, our students transition from Chromebooks to iPad minis. So we collect all those from our 8th grade students that are rising into ninth grade. But in the past, we have allowed students to keep um, their chargers and mm -hmm. um, the, the peripheral equipment because if you turn in your charger and you've slightly damaged it or, or bent it, do I really want my child to have that next year as a rising freshman? We don't want the freshmen to end up having the things that are um, torn and worn out. We want to make sure they have the things that are different. So we've gone through a couple of different um, trials and efforts of what's best for us. So the first year we collected devices and we cleaned everything off and reloaded everything to refresh them. Mr. Richardson, in, um, in instruction, our department's been working together on what the collection is going to like this year. Ms. Garris and Ms. Bonbillen have been involved with our digital integration specialist. We're going to compare it with textbook collection. So when our students turn in their textbook, we're going to collect these. And if there's anything that's been um, needs repair, needs a ticket put in for it to be repaired, we're going to make sure that we can take that care of over the summer so when the students return in August, their device is operational. Ms. Richardson, anything you want to add to that as far as the technology end of it? It is quite, you know, an investment, and, and I do think it's important. Um, I was going to ask you, too, do we require our kids to get the insurance on them, which is, I think, it's around $25, and if some students can't pay it, a lot of times our schools have a way to help them out, but we do make the parents and the student accountable that are taking them home and back and forth because it is quite a large investment. It certainly is. And um, so, so we do We do. That. Our fee is $40, and those students that have special provisions, um, we work out a deal with them. It may be a lesser rate, a longer, longer right. period of time, maybe a dollar a week, maybe just whatever the effort may be, because there's a kind of a contract, nothing legal and binding, of course, but a gentleman's agreement right. between personnel at the school and the family. So the efforts are made to make sure that no child is left without a device who wishes to accept a device. So first, a parent has to show interest and get permission for their child to take the device. And once the device is accepted, then we come up with a plan that will be appropriate for that family. But I will add, Mr. Richardson, um, we have deadlines that have to be secured for the insurance to be paid. So we have to make sure that we've collected the funds in a timely effort to make the insurance payments that we're required to have to keep the devices covered by the carrier that we use. And I'd like to just finish up with saying um, it is so important in, in our world today, and I'm so glad we are you know, innovative and we have this going on, and I'm sure most school districts do. But um, I would say in defense of teachers, you know, it's very hard to have planned your lesson totally around, and I tell you this as our curriculum person, to plan your lesson around it and four or five kids forget to bring it and don't have it. So now it's just like not having your book and your materials. So we have, a, we have something sort of in place for that. But still, it is hard when you are evaluating, um, you know, good lessons on them, which, and I was good, I was like Ms. Hutchinson, I'm glad we got a way that you were trying to evaluate it. But I do, I do want to say it's very, it has to be very flexible mm -hmm. for the teacher. And, and, you know, we have computers available, you know, so the kids can't get out of that. I said, well, sorry, I've got your computer you can go to and since you forgot your, you know, tablet. But I do think those are just things I want to speak up for. Thank you. Continue to, mm -hmm. to do everything we can that also, as you evaluate even a teacher on that, sometimes, you know, it's the student that doesn't have the, the actual device. And that Absolutely. can hurt the whole learning. I want to thank you for that report, too. It's, a, it's great to get those updates, and it's an evolving field. But as you've spoken tonight, I realize that Mr. Richardson is involved, Mr. Bounds is involved, and a lot of other folks. And I want to ask Ms. Bonavillan and Ms. Garris if they'd stand up. As usual, our District 5 folks are the backbone of it. They're in the background. But we want to thank you publicly. You're going to be here. It's sort of scary to me to think about all these units coming back in, and you mentioned their names is getting them ready for the, the turn. <laughs> that's a lot of devices to get to that point, and I know There's they'll be very busy. That's exactly right, Mr. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Great report. Thank you, uh, Dr. Melton. And now we will go to uh, Mr. Lynn Richardson, our Chief Finance Officer, for our uh, monthly financial reports. Thank you, Dr. Heffer. In your uh, packets in Exhibit B, I have your monthly financial statements for the months of February and March combined, since we did not, were not able to provide a, a financial report last month. Yeah. 
The uh, first two pages are our revenues collected to date. And by the way, we are officially, as, as of uh, March 31st, we're officially three-fourths of the way through the school year, or through the fiscal year, I should say. Um, the revenues on the first two pages, and out of uh, $166.4 million, we have collected everything but $33.6 million. Um, and when the April uh, financials are shown to you, you'll see that pick up quite a bit where we start getting some of our property tax money in the month of April. The next several pages are the expenditures for February and March, <clears throat> but I will draw your attention, excuse me, to the last page. And I will tell you, I apologize, I did not catch this prior to this going into the board packets, but our, our budget is uh, understated by $226,670. Uh, we had a an issue there that we've caught, but uh, not early enough for it to go into the board packet. So the remaining balance uh, showing on this last sheet, instead of $8.2 million, is actually about $8.4 million. Eight, four, five, three, four, six, four to be exact. And if you have any specific questions about anything on those preceding pages, I'll be glad to try to answer them at this time. Any questions for Ms. Richardson? Would he repeat the uh, amount it was short the, that you didn't have on? Was it two hundred? The the budget is show is actually two hundred twenty six thousand six hundred seventy dollars um, short. Right. It should read in the first column one six six four five one zero two one, and then the last column should read eight four five three four six four. Richard, I, I would just comment that I know you've implemented a new system this year, started last July trying to implement, and I, I can tell the quality of these reports continues to get better and better, and I, I hope you're feeling better and better about them because it's, it's eliminated some gaps that I'm sure we're giving you challenges late into the night. But you feeling good about the transition and the quality you're getting out of these reports? Uh, quite all, Yes, sir. I, we are now. Um, it, was, it was a struggle to begin with. But we, we figured that was going to happen. But, no, we're, I think we're getting more comfortable with it. Um, I'm sorry this happened, but uh, uh, unfortunately you can make a one-sided budget uh, entry and have this kind of problem, and we just didn't catch it in time before the board report. That's great. I uh, appreciate the fact you caught it. That's great. <laughs> Ms. Hutchison. As I get used to this um, new, new system, I find that I have more and more questions. And a lot of the different... Um, function categories, we have a line item that is called other objects. What is included in other objects? Well, that's a that's a, actually a part of the accounting um, handbook that the State Department gives us. Those are anything that don't actually don't fit into these other categories, like supplies, materials, equipment, or any kind of contract to service anything. You'd have things like uh, any kind of dues or fees that may be paid for organizations, um, those kind of things. I'm, there's plenty more I can't think of off the top of my head now, but those are typically small items or small amounts overall. Ms. Hammond. And mine is, goes sort of on that. Let me find it. I had it. Um, it's under the expenditures. It's... Uh, what are just, you've got the word function and then it's just information services. What, what are those? Those, okay. Those are the various functions. That's just how everything is. Um, like information services would be our public information office in this case. Um, but you'll see all the various categories. Anything with a, um, <clears throat> if you go back to the first few pages, anything with a 100 function, like 111 would be kindergarten, 112 would be primary, and so forth. I'm like Ms. Hutchinson, we'll, we'll figure this out. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's, it's easier to, you said it's going to be a lot easier for your, for your department. Any other questions? Not now. Richardson. I want to all right, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Richardson. That uh, concludes the uh, superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Hefner.